So first of all, bring attention to the body, to the present moment, establishing the mindfulness, the breath, the posture, sensation, just physical uh, feeling. And the uh, the way it is, this reflection, uh, the suchness, things are what they are in the present moment. It, we're not uh, we're not denying the reality of the present moment by claiming it's something other. But it is what it is, the suchness. Uh, they use datada, the Pali word, of a word that in English it's a bit difficult to translate. The as isness, the suchness. The datakada, the, when the Buddha referred to himself after his enlightenment as the datakada, the datta, the datta kada, that which is. Yeah, the, the as isness now, not a person, not a Prince Siddhartha, who is the son of King Sudodana, uh, and so forth, not a person with a history, or a past, or a personality, but that which is present now, this which is as is in the present. So establishing this, this awareness, uh, the present the ability to, to just open the mind, isn't it? Receptive attention in the present moment. And you can hear the ringing sound of silence. The body is like this, the breath. And in the state of mind, just the mood, the quality of mind you're experiencing, you're aware of, you can be, you can notice this whether you're feeling happy, sad, expansive, contracted, indifferent, peaceful, excited, whatever. And not just to observe. It's like this. It's suchness. So in this spacious, expansive awareness, then you can go to the breath, you can just notice the breath is like this. Inhalation is like this. Exhalation is like this. You can focus on a particular thing, but it's not like an, an, analyzing it or judging it. It is just noticing paying attention to that which is 
the way it is in the present. <clears throat> And go to the top of the head and just sweep through the sensation, consciously noting the way they are, the sensitive state of the, as I say, the body, external body, the tingling, vibrating. sensations that we notice when we're putting attention onto, say, the top of the head, and then there's the face, back of the neck, Notice the mouth, just observe the upper lip touching the lower lip. Then the corners of the mouth, the right corner of the mouth and the left. And going inside and where the tongue is, is notice the experience of wetness. The mouth has its wetness, the saliva, and the tongue touching the teeth or the palate. Notice any tensions in your face. The very sensitive area of the eyes, the ears, nose, the tongue, the mouth, the brain. This is a very sensitive, uh, delicate thing, this, this head. Now we're just conscious, putting it into conscious experience as for what it is, the sensitivity of it. Concentrate on the senses, on the sensitive, on the feeling of it, rather than what it looks like or we identify very much with the, with our face.
in the throat, uh, neck and throat and shoulders. Just a sweeping around the sensations. The throat, what's that like? People often speak from their throats rather than from their bellies. You get these, these kind of sounds up in the throat. Notice when I'm speaking from my belly it's like this. When I'm speaking from my throat, it's like this. <laughs> when you do chanting from your throat, you get worn out in five minutes, three minutes. Namo Tata Bhagavato. <laughs> That's the same. <laughs> Namo Tata Notice the hands, just contemplate right now, just the tingling sensations in your hands. Like you can use your hands like a rosary, just the each finger, thumb, forefinger, just noticing the tingling sensations at the tips of the fingers. And it's very relaxing if you just meditate on the sensations in your hands. Then compare the right shoulder with the left shoulder. I find it, I, my left shoulder gets seems that because I'm right-handed, then I seem to create tensions in the left very quickly. And as soon as I bring attention to the to the left shoulder and uh, wear those tensions, then they seem to they seem to relax. Another good one to develop is the top of the head to the base of the spine. Just think to yourself now, go to the top of your head and then to the base of the spine. That distance, you can kind of mindfully embrace that, your spinal column. So you're kind of sweeping up and down your spinal column from the top of the head, the neck down to the back and the base of the spine and then back up. Just see what happens as you just uh, observe the, think just the, using the thought, 
top of the head, base of the spine, spinal column, brings your attention to that. It becomes a conscious And notice your legs and feet. Where are your feet right now? Where are my feet? There they are. Big foot. I'm Bigfoot from the Northwest. Or is the left foot touching? Right foot. And then sweeping back up, just the whole, at the top of the head is the whole body. Just feel it. Get a feeling for, for the, for the whole body is one, one moment, one intuitive <coughs> experience. Like the silence and the consciousness embracing this vibrating, pulsating, body is one thing. And relax into the, the sound of silence, the cosmic hum, the primordial cosmic sound. Kind of, as it kind of permeates every cell of your body, expanding throughout the universe, infinite, no boundaries.
So this is like consciousness, vijnana, rupa, nama, salayatana. It's, uh, these are Pali terms that consciousness is like this. And it's like it's light. When it when uh, touches rupa, so you by bringing your the rupa or the body into consciousness, just by paying attention to the sensations in the body, to the to a part of the body, to a point or a part, a piece or a section or the whole. So then that is, and then the Nama is the Sanya Sankara, what we label it and perceive it as, as we perceive it as mine, uh, this is my body and this is my consciousness and my feelings and my thoughts is uh, what is nama but then I mean now we're, we're perceiving it as dattada as isness the way it is not a, not in a, not as a, not using personal pronouns or any kind of adjec- adjectives that convey quality or preference it is as it is like this as isness, suchness. Your consciousness is is functional. So we we conscious and be completely ignorant, self centered, demonic, and still be conscious beings. So now we're instructing, informing conscious experience through, with wisdom. We, we're, we're not operating from the force of habit or ignorance anymore, but developing wisdom. So the, seeing things as they are. Wisdom is, is, you know, wisdom is natural to us. It's not something uh, that you don't have. It's just ignorance gets in the way. Avicca, ignorance gets in the way. So then you, you, you t- interpret everything, experience life through avicca, ignorance. You, you let go of ignorance, then there's wisdom. It's natural. It's not, not an acquisition. Or it's not that some people have it and others don't. Maybe the degrees of ignorance vary. That's probably more like it, isn't it? Not some people are more wise than others. Some people are just more ignorant. And that's not one way of looking at it. And the ignorance in this sense is avicca, not, not having seen things as they really are. Doesn't mean being illiterate or anything. It means not having awakened and seen 
a dhamma, not knowing things as they really are, then we uh, experience life through the distortions of perception, through the twistedness, the kinks, the knots of of uh, our habits. We experience life through that. It becomes very distorted and painful for us. Panya, uh, wisdom is like, ultimately it's discerning the real from the illusory or the condition from the unconditioned. It's a very simple thing. It's not a, it's not knowing everything about everything. Like omniscience, isn't it? We think omniscience is knowing everything about everything. Like a supercomputer, uh, like God, that God knows everything about everything. God knows even what the flea is feeling at this moment. And the amoeba. I don't have a clue. I don't even know if there's a flea in this temple. I can't claim to know everything about everything. But I can know at this moment, discern the difference with the condition, the unconditioned. I can discern. This is within the human potential, not not a super superhuman state. The uh, material world, is, you can break down to the four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. And uh, these, this is one way of, of investigating, say, your own body. It's contemplating the earth element or the solid element. You can kind of observe in your body just what that would be, like the bones or the various things that have a kind of solidity of some sort, earthy solidity. And then fire, the heat, isn't it? Heat and cold and water. They say the body is, what, 97% water. We never think of ourselves as 97% water, do we? I think of these bodies as, as a kind of solid form. And then air, a kind of motion. Like observe, it's the, the, the movement, the ability to move. the heat, the liquid, the, the earth element. Then there's the consciousness and akasa. There's six elements. Consciousness, vinyana, and akasa. Space. Consciousness and space. So 
know, these, these ways of looking and investigating experience in terms of, of uh, breaking down the, the habits of always uh, experiencing the present uh, life through the distortions of, and the illusions of I am, of personality, me and mine. You start seeing it through, again, through, say, just the four elements, or the consciousness, space. And so, like with awareness, see the awareness is the uh, ability to that embraces conscious experience in the present. Uh, it's uh, sati sampachanya, sati panya. These words: mindfulness, awareness, attention knowing, reflecting, observing, witnessing. This this awareness embraces the moment. Intuitive, intuition. The English word intuition is... is, uh, is not discriminative, it embraces the present, it includes everything in this moment. Your discriminative awareness, <coughs> rather your, your rational mind, your, your ability to rationalize and analyze, then you're dividing up, comparing one thing with another. With intuitive awareness, you're including everything, So that's why when, you, when you're a thinker, when you're somebody that's caught up in rational thought as your identity, I'm a rational person, I analyze things and I, I depend on reason, logic and reason are my tools for experiencing life, uh, you'll find yourself very insensitive because those aren't sen- that you're, to, to be sensitive you have to Trust intuition with intuition, isn't it? Because thinking, when you're caught up in your own thoughts and analytical mind, you're not you're not being sensitive at that moment, because you're when you're when you're bound into rational thinking, you're you're not aware of the sensitive state of anything, because it's a logical process, and it and it because that's why. Intellectual people can be quite insensitive or callous uh, and cold because uh, they they think about everything and they can they understand it on that level of of analysis, but as an intuitive realization they've not maybe not developed that ability So, like, just contemplate an ideal. Perfect image in our mind of what, you know, the the perfect society, the perfect man, perfect woman, perfect monastery, perfect government. You can actually create an image in your mind of of the very best that conditions taken to the be- to what we would consider the best the highest but that is a that that image doesn't have any senses does it 
it doesn't feel anything. The ideal doesn't have any feelings. So, so when you're attached to ideals, ideas, then you, you, you're not feeling life anymore. You're just merely, uh, you know, thinking about life. And, and then you're, then you're also becoming very critical because life isn't ideal. Not, not perfect. This is not the best in terms of an ideal. An ideal is, is a dead thing, isn't it? It has no, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't live, it's, it's beautiful, definitely very beautiful, but it's, it's, uh, as an attachment, it, we, we die with our ideals and that we become like dead, dead people. So, so that, that is a, you know, we, we become insensitive. And in, with intuition, isn't it, you're like opening up and feeling, you're aware of the sensitive of your, sensitivity of the body as it is now. Not as the body as an ideal, the ideal human body as it should be according to the, what the best human body should be like, but it's the way it is, isn't it? Intuitively now you're aware of it as it is. It's an intuitive, isn't it? This, where you're actually beginning to notice the feeling of the body, the sensitivity of it. That's why you can embrace the whole body with the, with the intuition. A, you can get that sense of a whole body pulsating, vibrating. Or go to the, the to just one part of it. To the right knee or the whatever. And so the suchness, isn't it? The tat uh, is is like this, like this. The right knee is like this. What do you mean, right knee is like this? Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Couldn't describe my right knee right now, but I can certainly feel it at this moment. And notice in the the body just the senses as you observe the the orifices of the body, the nine orifices, the uh, two eyes, ears, the nostrils, the mouth, genital and anal orifices. We can contemplate the the orifices intuitively. Or the spinal column intuitively. Or just the experience of heat, the fire element, as an intuitive experience now. As you just think, uh, uh, use the word heat or fire. Or cold, because cold and heat are about temperatures.
And then feeling the body as a vibrating, pulsating, I find very peaceful. When I, when I swept through the sensations, the, the sense of, of it is a pulsating, vibrating, changing, vital thing, condition, as, as is. Quite, I find that very peaceful experience. So you can see how you, you know using the body as an object of meditation is uh, is why it is like the the basis for meditation. Anapanasati, breathing. You have to go right to the to the physical body grounding yourself in just the, the the basic functions of the body in meditation sometimes we really get we really want to have we we read books about you know meditators experiencing blissful uh, feelings you know and we say, oh, I'd like that. They get have some kind of mental state divorced of the body, some kind of blissful mental state. Where the body's kind of not not a part of it at all. It'd be nice just to live in a state of bliss. But the gamatana or the basis of meditation is on the very the heaviness of the body, the coarseness of it, the, the, the earthiness of it, its four elements, its, its wateriness, fire, air, those bones, blood, its sensitivity, because it is here and now, it's conscious, vibrating, conscious condition that's affecting this moment. It's here and now, Dhamma. Well, I could fantasize a perfect kind of heavenly ab abiding place. Live in a fantasy world, and uh, that would be quite pleasant. Uh, to create a, a fantasy life, which so, which is really what many pe people you know live in in the fantasy worlds, and they create uh, all these these kind of ideas based on ignorance. So in, when Buddha talks about the world, he's talking about what you create out of ignorance in your mind. Not talking about mountains and oceans and things like that. He's talking about the, the, uh, what you create out of avicca. The world that you create. Don't blame it on God. It's you, your creation. It's all about me and mine and, and, uh, fears and desires and, and praise and blame and happiness and suffering and so forth. And when we talk about the end of the world, that's not Armageddon in the sense of it all kind of explodes and disappears into space. But it's the physical world, but it's the letting go of that world that we create out of ignorance. It's the end of the world that so we, we begin to experience, realize the end of the world like this. It's peaceful. When you let the world in, what's left? Consciousness is still, there's feeling. 
is the way it is, isn't it? The, the body's like this, senses, consciousness, sound of silence. There's wisdom, clarity, peacefulness. How many people, you know, how many of you have, you know, really holding on to all kinds of things? It's because you're afraid of letting them go. If, if I, if I let go of this, if I don't have this, if I don't have that, I'll be too, it'd be too much pain. If I don't have financial, uh, enough money or don't have, I'm very dependent on this person, on this, person for my feeling of security and on things being this way or that way. So we're always kind of hanging around, holding on uh, to all kinds of things because we think if we let them go or, uh, that our life will be just uh, a miserable, you know, we just fear, feel fear of the unknown. But this is a way to test it. So you you know, in, in just in meditation, you don't before you give up all your money, become a monk or a nun, and and get get rid of all your money, and move away from your spouse, children, into a monastery, and uh, uh, be free from all the worldly cares, uh, and that according to an ideal. Before you do that, just try letting go of the world. See what it really is like. Not, not as, not no longer see it as some ideal that you should do, but you can't. But begin to recognize what it really is as experience. It's not, not getting rid of anything, but opening up, isn't it? Letting things be what they are and seeing them clearly, clear comprehension. So that you're not holding on to illusions about yourself or creating a world that's based on on ignorance. So if you test it out in this way, You know, then it's not coming from an ideal of renunciation, is it? Not, you're not starting from, you know, an ideal of, of what renunciation should be, of renouncing and getting rid of all your attachments and obsessions as some, something you should be doing, but you can't. But, the, because that's an ideal, you know, that's uh, maybe a very high-minded uh, grand view you have, of what should be, but being aware of how it, of, the, of the way it is in just this moment, you know, in the simplicity of this moment, the way, the conditions that you're experiencing now, no matter how trivial or important they might be, when you relax, when you say, you open the mind, you relax and observe the way things are. What is the result? The world ends. That's what I how, what I see. The end of the world. What happens? What's left after the world ends? Like this. What a relief. Not to carry a, a heavy, heavy, this, this, uh, you know, this atlas. This poor wretch that has to carry the world on his shoulders. The god atlas, a kind of titanic figure carrying the 
carrying the world on his shoulders. That's what that's very much what we do, isn't it? Bent under the weight of this enormously heavy burden. Uh, in in uh, upayas or skillful means, oh, like this this evening I've given skillful means, upayas. That I mean, this is uh, different ways of say just noting the the physical experience, the sensitive state of the body. Uh, so, I mean, you can, you can develop your own upayas. It's not, you have to use mine and, and I know what, what upayas you should use and, and, uh, it's not that. It's a, it's, you know, learning to, to know the kind of, uh, character you have, the kind of, where you get stuck, where you get blinded, where you're blind, where your blind spots are, where you, lose it, and where you uh, suffer the most. It's not the same with each one, doesn't have the same karma. So, so the upayas are very much, you know, developed around, you know, the using, uh, developing this mindfulness wisdom around the particular um, unique qualities that we have. Something that might be really, really difficult for me might have be no problem for you. Mm. Vice versa. Like the difference between a fast person and a slow person. I remember, fast person can understand a slow person. So a fast person thinks very fast, walks very fast, and zaps, zooms around, and, and why, why is that one so slow, you know? Think something wrong. Or a healthy person has a hard time understanding a sickly person. If you've always been healthy and strong, and, and you look at somebody who has a weak constitution and that, and you think, oh, what? Oh, they're just you know, because <laughs> you don't you don't know what it's like to to not have energy or to feel weakness. But whatever way we are, and not say there's any way anyone should be. It's just a. Uh, to work with the way we are, whether it's strong or weak or healthy or sickly or fast or slow or you know, so those aren't those are none of those are obstructions or or uh, you know that's that's our karma that we work with that we learn from. And it's also important to recognize that you have to learn from the way you are, not the way you should be, but the way you are, no matter what that means. Even if the way you are is, uh, you know, you don't particularly like it, or it's not all that, it's not what you consider, maybe you didn't get the best. Maybe you got inferior equipment when you were born. Uh, you were standing behind the door when God passed out all the good things. Maybe that happened, or you, you just... Uh, you know why do people why do people have like uh, this Glenn Hoddle thing um, about reincarnation? 
you're paying off for past, for mistakes in previous lives. That really upset the British recently. And then somehow it seems more sensible than thinking that God created everybody. Because it's not fair, isn't it? He created some people, and some people are born with, you know, deformed and weak constitutions, and why are some beautiful and some ugly and so forth? Not fair, isn't it? God, why doesn't he create us all the same? Perfect model, kind of a, a prototype that's perfect, and we'd all be exactly the same. We'd all be equally beautiful, healthy, strong. That'd be fair, wouldn't it? Completely fair. <clears throat> But it's hard to imagine living in a world where you're just looking at yourself. If you all look like me. <laughs> I don't know, it kind of would be hard to imagine. But they, but the, when we think of it in terms of, we learn from the way we are. We're like this. I'm like this. I have to learn from this. Not that I, I mean, if I look at other people, I think it wouldn't be nice if I were like that. Why did I get stuck with this lot? But when I change it, this is what I have to learn from. This character, this, this being, this body, this personality, this karma. This is, this is the, this is the stuff. This is the, what the, I must learn from this, not from, but I can't learn from, from your karma, but from my own, from the way it is, good or bad, good and bad. And so when you contemplate this, then you don't, you aren't carrying resentments about it's not fair, and you got stuck with poor health, or you didn't get the best, and, and then feel like you're, you know, somehow you've been cheated, and you're a victim of life. Well, you can change that into saying that this, this is, you learn from this. Because none, the way we are, whether how good or a superior or inferior it is, isn't really the issue, isn't it? None. Inferior weakness, uh, disabilities, and and uh, traumas, and all these things are not obstructions to enlightenment. These aren't. These aren't obstruct. The obstruction is ignorance, desire, and attachment. So then you think there, we're here now because this is the Buddha addresses this very directly: how to awaken from ignorance.